The next item of business is a statement by Rosanna Cunningham on the Scottish Greenhouse Gas Emissions Annual Target Report for 2017. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement, so no interventions or interruptions, please. And I call on Rosanna Cunningham for up to 10 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is my first statement on climate change since the Climate Change Bill was passed, and it will be my last under the terms of the 2009 Act. In future years, statutory reporting on targets will only take place in the summer when the statistics become available and will not need to be repeated in October. However, right now, we are still under the terms of the 2009 Act, and yesterday I laid the annual target report for 2017 in Parliament. It shows that we have already almost halved emissions since 1990, and Scotland continues to outperform the UK. In the EU 15, only Sweden has performed better than Scotland. The 2017 target was not met, partly because of the technical adjustment relating to the EU emissions trading system. Actual emissions, however, which are what matters for, ta for tackling climate change, reduced by 3.3% between 2016 and 2017. And in future, progress to targets established under the bill will be based on those actual emissions improving transparency. And the remainder, the remainder of this statement will focus on that future. Members will be aware that yesterday President Piñera announced that Chile will no longer host COP25, uh, COP which was due to be held in Santiago in December, um, and that's because of political unrest and widespread demonstrations. And I'm saddened by the events in Chile and the announcement about hosting the COP. It is vital that all nations continue to work closely together to address the global climate emergency, and this summit is a crucial part of that dialogue. I note that the UN is currently exploring alternative hosting options and I hope that it is possible for another venue to be found. Next year, we will of course welcome thousands of people to Glasgow for COP26. We will do so proud in the knowledge that we have redefined international climate leadership. When the, uh, when the bill uh, receives royal assent, which uh, happens to be today, uh, presiding officer, Scotland will have by far the most stringent climate legislation of any country in the world. Our end target to reach net zero greenhouse gases by 2045, five years ahead of the UK, is at the limit of feasibility. Scotland's new 75% emissions reduction target for 2030 it goes far beyond what the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says is needed globally to manage the risk of more than 1.5 degrees warming. It's undoubtedly an aspirational target requiring hard, concerted, unrelenting effort by government, parliament, business, public authorities, communities, and indeed individuals, if it is to be achieved. This government is leading by example and has already stepped up its response. Our program for government has the global climate emergency and a Green New Deal for Scotland at its heart. We are investing billions in tackling climate change. Over 500 million pounds investment in improved bus infrastructure, committed to investing two billion pounds over 10 years to capitalize the Scottish National Investment Bank, with £130 uh, million pounds investment this year to support the establishment of the bank and support early financing activities. A £3 billion pound portfolio of projects, including renewables, waste and construction, would be brought to market over the next three years. And that is just the start. Within six months of today, we will publish an update to the Climate Change Plan to meet the new annual targets out to 2032. And the update will review our approaches and look for where more can be done across all key sectors, such as agriculture, domestic energy and transport. It will build on our ambitious programme for government commitments, such as creating a new agricultural transformation programme, setting new standards to reduce energy demand within new buildings by 2021, and consulting on the ambition to make the transformative shift to zero or ultra-low emission city centres by 2030. The update to the climate change plan is part of a wider picture. It will be taken forward in parallel with other key strategies to support the transition to a net zero emission Scotland, including reviews of the national planning framework and national transport strategy and the development of a new infrastructure investment plan. Six months is a fraction of the time it would take to produce a new climate change plan. I hope the Parliament will share this urgency when undertaking its own scrutiny of the update. As Scotland's response to the emergency steps up, it is more important than ever that everyone is engaged in the decisions we take. The school strikes have made it very clear that young people across Scotland want to see bold action. 
and we will deliver that. But measures which are either unfair or perceived as being unfair will not be accepted by the public and nor should they be. A just transition is central to our approach and the bill ensures this is now firmly reflected in law. I launched the big climate conversation in June and to date over 2,000 people have participated. Earlier this month, the Sustainable Scotland Network held a conference to discuss the role of the public sector in tackling climate change. Next month, I will co-convene a Mission Zero Business Summit with the Finance Secretary. The Just Transition Commission began its work at the start of this year and has been travelling the country hearing the views of community groups, industry bodies, businesses and trade unions. To date, it has held meetings on energy, transport, the built environment and oil and gas and has conducted a range of associated engagement activity. This included co-hosting an event with the Energy Institute targeted at young people in industry. The Commission also visited Aberdeen Heat and Power to witness the impact of district heating schemes on alleviating fuel poverty among some of the most vulnerable sections of the population. They also met a community group in Kincardine to explore lessons that could be learned from our transition away from coal power generation. The Commission is functioning independently, but I am confident that given the breadth of its engagement, its recommendations will reflect the concerns and aspirations of people across the country. I've asked the Commission to produce an interim report at the start of the new year, outlining the emerging themes so it can inform the update to the Climate Change Plan. Strong public engagement and our commitment to a just transition will continue beyond the update to the Climate Change Plan. Formal plans are important documents, but engagement and planning never really stop. It is a continuous loop as we learn more about what works and what is needed. Following the update to the Climate Change Plan, we will hold a Citizens' Assembly on climate change. We will also establish a national forum for continued discussion, partnership working and joined up action. Presiding officer, while significant emissions reductions are needed, this is not our only focus. Following extensive stakeholder and public consultation, we laid the new climate change adaptation programme in Parliament last month. The programme adopts an outcomes-based approach derived from the UN Sustainable Development Goals and Scotland's National Performance Framework. It will deliver a step change in collaboration and strongly promotes the wider co-benefits of climate action. For the first time, it includes behaviour change. It also includes research to improve our understanding of climate risks and an integrated approach to monitoring and evaluation. The programme is a substantive response to the impacts of climate change and will help to create a stronger, better society. We expect to hear soon that the UN's formal confirmation that the joint UK-Italy bid to host COP26 in Glasgow in 2020 has been successful. I know that Scotland's NGOs, businesses and of course the City of Glasgow are all ready to play their part next year. The Scottish Government expects to work collaboratively with the UK Government, not just in delivering a successful event, but also in driving the ambition of COP26. We've offered to support the UK's policy development with Scottish Government specialists. I know there is support for the Scottish Government playing a significant role across parties and within the ENGO com community. Of course, we're already involved in the logistics, which require the support of the City Council, Police Scotland and various Scottish Government agencies to deliver. We will, however, maintain the pressure on the UK Government to deliver the full costs of policing, not just the Congress itself, but the wider impacts across Scotland. Presiding Officer, our new Climate Change Bill redefines climate leadership. Living up to the targets will require different and more difficult choices than has been the case to date, and only with the full support of the whole of Scottish society, including Parliament, will we be able to achieve the enormous transformational change that is needed. If we all accept that responsibility, Scotland can and will be at the forefront of the low carbon future in a strong position to reap the economic and social benefits that that entails and will create the conditions for a strong and secure future for our young people and for generations yet to come. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on issues raised in her statement for around 20 minutes. Would those who wish to ask a question please press the request to speak buttons and call Maurice Golden. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for an advanced copy of the statement. 
It will be of deep concern to the Chamber that the 2017 statutory emission reduction target has been missed. Of course, I recognise that this is in part due to the revision mechanisms agreed in the 2009 Climate Change Act. Nevertheless, transport emissions increased between 2016 and 2017 and urgent action is required in the housing sector. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline the process for revising the Climate Change Plan in light of the new requirements in the Climate Change Act and define Parliament's role in scrutinising this? Rosanna Cunningham. Um, I thank uh, Maurice Golden for his question. Um, and uh, yes, of course, we too are disappointed that the apparent fall uh, in emissions is not reflected in the statistics. Um, as I indicated in my opening statement, however, um, from next year, we will be looking only at actual emissions. And I think that will probably give a far clearer understanding of where um, Scotland is. Um, I anticipated that there might be some questions around the climate uh, um, change plan update, which was why I also advised uh, um, the Chamber that the um, Royal Assent was received literally only a couple of hours ago. So the clock is now ticking on the six-month commitment deadline. Um, and that, uh, as I indicated or hinted, uh, does also mean that uh, colleagues across the Chamber will have to think very carefully about the speed with which they um, uh, deal with this. Um, we are, uh, in a sense, already starting on that. Um, we weren't going to wait until the uh, update. So um, uh, the, the update uh, is being done in a fraction of the time. And I think, as I understand the position, we hope to be able to give the, uh, the new draft uh, um, to uh, the Committee for Consideration, allowing them some three months to consider it themselves. Now, these are challenging timescales for Parliament to deal with. I appreciate that. Um, but I'm hoping that that will be able to uh, uh, be done. Um, and we have also got, of course, to engage with stakeholders and the public throughout this process um, as well. Um, so with a will from everybody, we will manage to do this in the time that we have available. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, presiding officer. And I thank Cabinet Secretary for prior sight of the statement. And this Parliament must, of course, deliver a robust policy for just transition if we are to be true leaders in Glasgow. I welcome the clarification today of the revised Climate Change Plan, the Citizens' Assembly and the Just Transition Commission's initial report, although I still urge the government to reconsider its limited lifespan. Agriculture is the second biggest contributor to Scotland's overall emissions, but crucially, is it also part of the solution? If we are to enable Scotland's land managers and farmers to respond to the climate crisis, the government must commit to careful planning, quality data and the involvement of rural communities across Scotland. Can the Cabinet Secretary update on the next steps to be taken to implement the regional land use frameworks as committed to in the programme for government and by Labour amendments to the Climate Change Act? Um, Rosanna Cunningham. Well, I, I welcome Claudia Beamish's comments. As she knows, in terms of the Just Transition Commission, the commission has been set up for an initial two years and no decision has been made uh, um, that that would necessarily end it. We will wait and see what the interim report says and then what the final report says before we consider what next steps might be taken within the Just Transition framework. Um, but our commitment to Just Transition um, is longer than, uh, uh, than just that. So, uh, you know, there may be some uh, future developments that don't look exactly like this particular commission, but nevertheless are taking the whole, whole issue forward. The, uh, um, the member has asked uh, specific questions around uh, agriculture, and I, I know my colleague, uh, Fergus Ewing, is uh, very aware uh, of the potential, but also the challenges that there are in, uh, in, uh, in achieving continued uh, emissions reductions, but emissions reductions are already taking place in the agriculture sector, and I think we owe, uh, uh, owe it to ourselves to acknowledge that and to understand uh, that that work is ongoing and that farmers, uh, um, in the main, are pretty much on board uh, uh, with this. Mm. Um, the, the, we, we hope to be developing the regional uh, land use pa partnerships over the next year, and uh, uh, I will come back, uh, you know, as regularly as I can to Parliament. Um, in respect of each stage of that. Obviously, these things don't happen overnight, 
Um, and uh, uh, I, I know from the conversations that I have across the board in the, in the farming community, whether that's tenanted or landowning farming, um, and indeed in, in many of the bigger estates, that there is a huge commitment here to actually make a really positive change for Scotland for the future. We move to open questions. Uh, Mark Ruskell, followed by Stuart Stevens. Thanks. The Cabinet Secretary said in a statement that Sweden is performing better than Scotland. Next year, Sweden will meet all of its heating needs from renewable energy, while in Scotland we'll meet less than a tenth of our needs from renewables. Is the Scottish Government prepared to learn from Sweden, in particular their approach to industry action plans, which can help to smooth supply chains and drive demand? Because even when the renewable heat incentive was high before the Tories cut it, it really failed to make the changes. And now we're looking at failed targets on heating. Rosanna Cunningham. Um, well, that's quite a general question. And I think I would hope that Mark Ruskell and everybody else in the chamber was absolutely uh, conscious of our willingness to learn from almost anywhere else if there were lessons to be learned, just as other countries could learn from us. And uh, I am happy uh, to talk to my Swedish counterparts um, and indeed have had meetings uh, with them, would probably intend to have meetings with them at the COP, wherever that might now uh, be, um, uh, but not just with Sweden. Um, I, I've spoken before with our New Zealand counterparts, I've spoken with Danish counterparts, and I will continue to do that. Um, but equally, can I say that it isn't a one-way process, and as willing as I am to learn from other countries, perhaps some other countries uh, could also learn from us. And I note that although Sweden is ahead of us uh, in terms of the EU15, and we you know, concede their leadership role in that. Nevertheless, um, we include a share of aviation and shipping in our stats. Sweden doesn't. So maybe they could learn something from us as well. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Billy Rennie. Uh, Cameron, it's actually in your statement you referred to external events that have affected the outcome under review here uh, related to the emissions trading scheme. Um, I know that you wrote to the UK government in May about the actions they need to take that will affect our ability to meet our targets. Uh, is there any response that would be helpful to understand how we're going to do in future? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, I haven't received a substantive response to the letter I sent in May. Um, to the best of my knowledge, the UK government hasn't made any progress on any of the issues that I raised uh, therein. Uh, they may have been otherwise occupied over that period of time, which is a shame because it's far from satisfactory. I can assure members that both myself and my officials have been trying to get a substantive response for some time now. We now have another hiatus, um, and I will continue to, continue to pursue this matter with any new UK government. But I do want to be very clear, I don't want to allow any UK government to get in the way of Scotland achieving its ambitions to play our full part in helping to end climate change. Willie Rennie, followed by Julie Martin. Uh, there are some useful measures outlined in our statement today, but the Cabinet Secretary is right that different and difficult choices will be required. So when she's in discussion with the UK Government and since the declaration of the climate emergency, will the Cabinet Secretary raise the issue of the third runway at Heathrow? Because I assume now that the Scottish Government will write to the Prime Minister and withdraw its support for that third runway in light of the climate emergency. Rosanna Cunningham. I'm absolutely certain that Willie Rennie knows perfectly well that that, not, that letter would not emanate from my portfolio. Um, I will make sure that my uh, colleague, uh, who is the appropriate minister for this, is advised of Willie Rennie's um, uh, uh, um, interest in this. Um, I, I note that uh, you know, he doesn't really have anything to say about uh, climate change beyond that, which is a pity, because there's quite a lot that could have been said even within the aviation sector, and I won't attract your ire by going on about it. Gillian Martin, followed by Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. It is unfortunate that difficult decisions have been made not to hold COP25 in Chile, which I understand the Cabinet Secretary was to attend. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what areas the Scottish Government was intended to highlight where other countries stand to learn from Scotland's leadership in climate change. Rosanna Cunningham. Yes, it, it is a shame uh, what has happened, um, uh, if perhaps understandable. It, it is, however, still vital that the international community work together. I had planned to attend 
and highlight the progress Scotland is making in reducing emissions while promoting sustainable and fair economic growth through the work of the Just Transition Commission, which I find to be of enormous interest wherever I go internationally to talk about climate change, um, and the leadership on both climate justice and gender considerations, which are both things which uh, many activists in many other countries would wish their own governments to be interested in. I was also looking forward to deepening our international partnerships, for example, through the Under Two Coalition, and I will continue this at COP26 next year, and in whatever shape or form COP25 um, now takes. Finlay Carson, followed by Stuart McMillan. Today's figures remind us that agriculture is a major source of emissions in Scotland, but we must also recognise that farmers are already making big changes to help with the climate <coughs> crisis, and they're willing and able to go further, but they need support to do so. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on the development of the Agricultural Transition Fund that was committed to in the programme for government and which Scottish Conservative Amendment secured in the Climate Change Bill? Rosanna Cunningham. Um, I'm advised by my colleague that uh, the government is already providing very substantial amounts of money to farmers in respect of the environment. Um, uh, and uh, I know uh, the member's interest. However, he must also know that it is an area in which we are and have significant uh, uh, interest. And as I indicated in an earlier response, uh, want to very much support farmers through, through the process of change um, and find that they are in themselves uh, very keen to do so. Stuart McMillan, followed by Sarah Boyack. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, the cabinet secretary will be well aware that the disposable be beverage cups in Scotland produce an estimated 5,900 uh, tonnes of CO2 per year, with much of this coming from the plastic lid. So I welcome the announcement of, of the Scottish Government that's going to legislate for a charge to be applied on single-use drinks cups as part of the Circular Economy Bill. But can the Cabinet Secretary also outline what other actions the Scottish Government is taking to tackle the environmental impact of single-use plastics? Rosanna Cunningham. We are um, taking a range of action on single-use plastics in Scotland and are aiming to meet or exceed the standards set out in the EU's single-use plastics directive. We're proud to be the first UK administration to introduce regulations which ban plastic stemmed cotton buds. We will take further action by restricting sales of other problematic single-use plastic items such as cutlery, plates and food and drink containers by July 2021. We will carefully consider the potential impacts on equality, in particular for disabled people, and apply exemptions where appropriate. Sarah Boyack, followed by Bruce Crawford. What new resources is the Scottish Government allocating to ensure that local authorities have the funding and capacity to lead the transition on low carbon, affordable community heat and power schemes across the country and the re-engineering and planning of our communities to deliver low carbon transport and active travel to support employment, health and reduce our emissions? Rosanna Cunningham. I think as the member knows, we no longer hypothecate funding to local authority. Uh, the agreements are done on an, uh, a basis of negotiation with COSLA uh, and an agreed uh, um, uh, amount of money is then dispersed to individual local authorities to make decisions uh, on issues as and when uh, they choose. And I want to congratulate a number of local authorities um, for very high ambition indeed. Um, and I, I see that you know, the, the very high ambition of the likes of Glasgow, Edinburgh and some others is, is creating uh, a bit of competition amongst local authorities, which I can think is only to the good. But it is for local authorities themselves to make decisions about how they spend their money, um, uh, what they choose to do. Um, and uh, uh, that, I expect, will be a significant conversation between COSLA and the Scottish Government uh, each time they meet to discuss that annual uh, global figure. Bruce Crawford, followed by Alexander Burnett. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, President Officer, I support the Scottish Government and their efforts to ensure that Scotland meets the world-leading climate change targets. To that end, however, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me what consideration the Scottish Government is giving to encouraging local planning authorities to take a more relaxed approach to the installation of solar panels on homes and conservation areas such as Kings Park and Stilling City in my constituency? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, um, this is not a planted question, but it does resonate extraordinarily with me as I live in a conservation area <laughs> and I have some of the same issues that Bruce Crawford is raising in respect of his constituents. Um, the programme for government does commit us 
to reviewing and extending permitted development rights in a range of areas, including micro-renewables such as domestic solar panels. And I think that's very good news indeed. We commissioned a sustainability appraisal to consider the social, economic and environmental impacts, including the potential impacts on conservation areas of such changes. And we'll be shortly publishing the findings together with a proposed work programme for taking forward the consideration of such changes. Um, I can assure Bruce Crawford that he, uh, he, he may be uh, very interested uh, in uh, uh, that work when it's published, but so will I. Alexander Burnett, followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I note members to my register of interest in renewable energy. Now, it was detailed in Scottish Power's Zero Carbon Communities report last week that the installation cost of heat pumps to homes have been es estimated at 16.5 billion, with over 70 to be installed every day between now and 2045. Uh, so can I ask, is the support currently given by the Scottish Government to the sector sufficient to achieve this target? Rosanna uh, I'm advised there's a 30 million pound fund uh, for doing this. Um, my, uh, my guess is, and I may be wrong, that some of the issues won't just be about money, they will also be about um, availability of, of skills and materials, etc. These are some of the practical challenges that we will all face when it comes to trying to make some of the really uh, big changes that require to be made. Uh, I know from previous experience of uh, the, you know, developing the existing climate change plan that some of the rapid acceleration of change that you might wish to see uh, can be stymied uh, because of not so much money as, as inability to physically do some of the work that is necessary. So there is money there, um, um, and I'm sure my colleague uh, to my right will uh, engage directly with, uh, um, uh, with the member uh, on some of the detail, but I would guess that it was more than just money that is an issue in this. And the last question is from John Mason. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, we sometimes notice that uh, opposition MSPs are very keen to have ambitious targets, but when it comes to practical issues like the workplace parking levy, they are wholly opposed to them. D does, she think, does she think that we can get the, reach these targets by easy methods, or will there also be some difficult decisions to make? Rosanna Cunningham. Yes, who can you mean? Um, it never ceases to amaze me just how often the opposition in the chamber will be happy to will the ends, but not the means. And of course, that, frankly, will not be possible in the future. As I made very clear during the debates on the climate change bill, if we set bold and ambitious targets, then we have to be prepared to take bold and ambitious action to meet them. All parties that supported the 75% target for 2030 did so knowing how enormously challenging that will be and must now be prepared to join us in making the difficult decisions necessary to deliver it. But we've also got to not lose sight of the opportunity that addressing and mitigating climate change represents. It is a challenge, but there are also opportunities. There are opportunities in skills and jobs and industries and new technologies that can help support the economic and social well-being uh, of the country in the future. And we do also have to grasp those opportunities fully. That concludes questions on the Scottish Greenhouse Gas Emissions Annual Target Report for 2017 and we will move on to the next item of business.